For Krumu Media's policy, I'm Zashni Mali. Global activist Kumi Naidu joins me today to unpack his memoir, Letters to My Mother, The Making of a Troublemaker. Your book deals with the deaths of so many of your loved ones across your life. Uh, more specifically in this book, you reflect on your mother's death, which you say was a catalyst for your political awakening. Just tell us how. I was already politically aroused before my mom's suicide. In fact, I write about how she found articles that I'd been clipping of uh, Steve Biko's murder in detention and was freaking out about it as parents at that point would freak out because just doing that could carry uh, some suspicion and from that suspicion, harassment. Two weeks after she passed was also the National Student Uprising. Uh, which started in the Western Cape in the college schools and spread like wildfire throughout the country. And in uh, KwaZulu Natal, uh, or Natal as it was then known, uh, there was also quite large levels of support, even though at that time in Qatar uh, had control of a lot of areas and schools. And in those areas, it was very difficult for protests to happen. The participation in the 1980 school boycotts then just kind of put you in a situation where there were so many different ways you could get involved in the struggle, setting up a youth organization, which is what we did, and so on. So the truth is, I would not have been able to have uh, participated as actively as I did in the 1980 school boycotts and then be as actively involved afterwards because obviously, one of the sad things was that my relationship with my dad at that time broke down and I had no parental control. So I had become basically a full-time activist, right? And so when I say that it was a catalyst, it was really saying that um, the hole that was left as a result of a departure, uh, I kind of filled it with... Uh, committing myself 100% to the struggle for against apartheid. And and I would just say that I had some advice from a friend of my dad, uh, a working class guy called Uncle John Pillay, who basically said, uh, my boy, I don't know how one recovers from something like this, but live with purpose, promote the dignity of all people and do something you know positive with your life. And that was the advice I, I followed. And I'm glad for it. And uh, writing the book, I didn't know whether for 100% sure that I would publish it. It was healing and therapy. And I then became convinced by my friends who had read it and gave me feedback that, that it could help other people in their own healing processes. And that's what I hope the book does. Steve Biko's death while it sparked your anger against the apartheid system as well, it also made you think about your identity. Yes, very much so. I mean, at that time, I think I would have uh, seen myself as uh, Indian and add in sort of Indian identity. And I don't think there is a problem with having an Indian identity and a black identity because the way Steve Biko put it, he said, by all means, be proud of your Indian culture, your African heritage and so on. But... When you're looking at where you direct your anger, make sure you're directing it at the person that's sitting on your neck, you know? And and the use of the term black that was used in the liberation struggle included by all the main liberation movements included, when you said black, you meant uh, African Indian and colored uh, people. And that was the way I, uh, you know, the identity I had then and the identity I have now. And uh, that didn't stop me from recognizing the contradictions of the Natal Indian Congress, but, uh, but still participating in it because it was strategically the right thing to do in a context where many people of Indian origin had been bludgeoned by messages of fear for a very, very long time. And by manipulation as well, when you see the kinds of uh, events we even saw in uh, 2021 20, in July in Durban. Now, you also write about your son, Ricardo, or as he is known in the entertainment world, Ricky Rick, 
And you say that his death showed you the correlation between poor mental health and the atrocities of the world. So to Ricardo, you know, most people would have seen Ricardo as a successful person. You know, he was at the top of his game, uh, but he never lost his groundedness. He continued to do things to help other people and so on. His passing, you know, in my last conversation with him, um, all the things that were troubling him that he verbalized to me at that point was about things that were happening in the public space, the death of some young people that he was mentoring and supporting who died in violent incidents and in car accidents and so on. And he was lamenting the fact that life had become so cheap in South Africa and in fact, you know, on the continent. And then the second thing was about corruption and called what was happening about call it crazy corruption and then also just a sense of no like sort of hope you know for his generation and and so all of these things that were having a impact on ricardo's well-being right i'm not saying that there weren't other things as well potentially but were clearly a big part of his the impact on his life. So when we look at our young people today in our country, we need to almost concede that adult political leadership is traumatizing our young people by reducing their options, by engaging in such high levels of corruption and theft and looting and so on. Uh, and so in that sense, you know, uh, one of the things I said, you know, to be, to have good wet, uh, would be very hard in if you're a sensitive human being looking around you, seeing the inequalities, seeing the you know uh, extreme injustices and 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 failure of uh, uh, basic governance uh, services are not just available to many people in many municipalities. See, when we were young. When I was a young activist, which is what I write about in the book, uh, things were really dire. We were facing a very tough, repressive state and all of that, right? But you know one thing? We had huge amounts of hope. You know, we participated from a basis of optimism. And sadly, today, I see lower levels of hope in a post-apartheid reality than I saw when we were facing the might of the in 83, you actually clashed with Amishan Rajbansi, who was head of the SA Indian Council. Why were you so strongly opposed to the SAIP? The South African Indian Council was firstly an advisory body. Nobody had voted for it um, for most of its existence. And in the one election or substantive election they had in 1981, uh, it had a dismal uh, turnout and true people like me in my youth campaigned against those elections and um, and you know most people call the South African Indian Council the SAIC the South African Indian Circus because even left to their own devices the shenanigans the conflicts the corruption all of that was always what dominated media headlines and so for most people they knew that this was not a body that really was representing their interests but was an elite body that people call either a puppet body, a dummy body, and so on. So what we were keen to do was to make sure that we mobilize people to stand up for the issues around them in terms of bread and butter issues, but also that they should connect those struggles to the broader anti-apartheid struggle. And that basically was the activism that me and hundreds of people engaged in uh, in the various townships of Durban from you know, Lamontville to Phoenix, from Chatsworth to Pomashu uh, to Wentworth uh, and so on. And, and during that time, you know, ironically, I would say there was probably significantly more democratic participation, you know, in the sense where people were in youth organizations and student movements, women's groups, in residence association, organizing variety concerts as we used to call them, and slipping into those variety concerts, very gentle political messaging, because if you were obvious, it wouldn't go ahead. But also, if you were obvious, 
then people wouldn't come to the events because they'd be scared. And I think uh, today, I think most of the younger generation probably don't have, this, have a sense of what it was to live with that kind of perpetual depression over you. It's a very different reality. But even with us not having to deal with the depression or we're young people today not having to deal with the scale of repression that we engage uh, had to deal with, I still see lower levels of hope somehow. And I think a real uh, task for us as and for those in leadership is to create an enabling environment where young people are able to participate more actively in public life in all levels. If you look at the demography of our country and the demography of our political leadership, and even if you look at it continentally, there's a very, very big disconnect. Our leadership is substantially older and our demography is getting substantially younger. And that makes for very dangerous dynamics from even a good governance perspective, I would say. Can you tell us about the Don't Vote campaign that you were involved in in the 80s and about how security forces raided your family home looking for you? The Don't Vote campaign that I wrote about was the 1984 tricameral parliament elections where the apartheid government was trying to co-opt the support of Indians and Coloreds by offering them Indian and Colored chambers. And uh, these were, again, you know, rather toothless bodies. And again, it was full with corruption, intrigue, people crossing parties every other month and all of that. That campaign for me taught me about campaigning like nothing else has ever taught me about campaigning, you know, uh, in the sense that that campaign was designed for phases. The first one was reach and teach, which was information, then it was mobilizational, then it was agitational, and then, you know, like that. And, uh, and I learned you know, for all my work that I would subsequently do at Greenpeace and Amnesty and Civicus and other movements that have been part of globally, that was probably the best uh, workshop training degree that that 1984 Donwood campaign. There was such an excellent planning. Uh, I was a very young person at that time. I was not in the leadership. I was a foot soldier. But even as a foot soldier, I, I, I learned a lot uh, from that campaign. And I'm grateful for the lessons that I learned from it. And just talk to us a little bit about security forces, you know, being on your heels and about how they raided your home looking for you. Government had a very high vested interest in making sure that that uh, election had some legitimacy. So they used a lot of repression to uh, stop the resistance to encouraging people, you know, not to vote and so on. I was then living at the Lake Haven Children's Home, which was a home for boys in uh, um, chats with them that and we got raided multiple times including uh, one of the boys Jude Francis being arrested while I was the house father there and he then subsequently uh, you know ends up in prison and when they come looking for me and they uh, and and he then joins the underground of the ANC ends up in prison on Robben Island. And yeah, there's been a lot of trauma, you know, uh, people don't realize how people's lives were disrupted uh, and how exceptional sacrifices people like Jude Francis, Lenny Naidu and many others made uh, from uh, communities like Chatsworth. And uh, certainly I found it, uh, you know, inspirational learning from these campaigns. And it doesn't mean we got everything right. We, we, and also the fact that we were young, we had to build in ways in which we could make sure it was an enjoyable experience to keep large numbers of the young people engaged. So even in the way we did the evaluations, the debriefs at the end of the evening, you know, uh, I remember David Madure, another very committed activist, and myself would always try to do that in a way that got people to laugh and, and, and so on, because, you know, you had to keep your optimism up. And I would say this today, in the as young people are facing the reality of climate change and as it gets worse and so on, as they struggle to fight for the future, there's a critical necessity for them and for everybody involved is to keep a sense of optimism and to celebrate each other in the way you mobilize people, use arts and culture, song and dance and so on to keep our spirits up because in the coming decades, whether we like it or not, 
our well-being will be challenged even more than it's being challenged now. And for that reason, we need to respond in our resistance with community, with love, with compassion, and also a sense of we will not allow the injustices of those that should know better to rob us of what little happiness we might still be able to experience even under very difficult, oppressive, oppressive uh, conditions. Can you tell us more about uh, Jumu Nkize, who you write about in your book, and the significant influence you say that he had on you? So Jomo was from the Makabeni Youth Organization. It was, he, Makabeni was about 40 kilometers from Durban, uh, in a sort of semi-rural township, if you want. And he was probably one of the most bravest, most smartest, most strategic, most committed organizers I ever met at the grassroots level. We were part of something called the Youth Forum, which was a coordinating body for various youth formations in different parts of KwaZulu-Natal. We became close because often when we had coordinating meetings, we had to drop him back in the township and those comrades that had cars, you know, I would go along with them to drop him off and in the process became very close. Unfortunately, two weeks after the launching of the Makabeni Youth Organization, he was already murdered in a very brutal way. And, uh, but his organization continued to exist and continued to flourish and, uh, and so on. Being at his funeral was one of the most scariest and frightening experiences of my life because there was um, such a danger that the funeral was going to be attacked violently. And, but coming out of that strengthened me quite a bit to to be open to taking higher levels of risk when those risks were called for. In the book, one of the questions that you reflect on is whether activism has failed. And you yourself, you know, you're a well-known activist. So what made you question um, activism success? And do you think that it has failed? We are at a very critical moment of world history at the moment. As Aminka Cabral, the leader of the Guinea-Bissau anti-colonial movement, said, we should tell no lies and claim no easy victories. We are looking at what the science is saying less than 10 years to go before we might enter irreversible, catastrophic, runaway climate change. We're already seeing the impacts of it. Climate change itself is a reflection of a broken economic system, a broken food system, a broken energy system, and so on. We need to make massive, massive changes. So yes, many of us uh, have struggled for decades and decades to make progress on these issues. And right now we must say that Yes, had it not been for those struggles and so on, things would have been significantly worse, no doubt about it. But things are certainly not as good as what we had fought for, right? We did not fight for simply that the world should know that there were people who stood up and said this was mad, what was happening. Right? We stood up because we want to make sure that the madness stopped. And the reality is we have not stopped the madness of greed, of exploitation, of injustice, and so on, right? And so in that sense, we have to say, we must move forward now in a world where we are seeing a convergence of crises and a perfect storm, where inequality is colliding with climate, with uh, you know, the rise of gender exploitation, all of these things. And we need to connect the dots and operate in an intersectional way and recognize that one of the biggest weaknesses of activism is that we cannot speak fast enough, simply enough, accessibly enough to the people who are in the front lines of the various struggles that we are engaged in. So one of my responses to the current challenges we have in terms of that communications challenge is to promote the idea of artivism. And that is the coming together of arts, culture, and activism. Because if you look historically in many movements, music, song, dance, uh, other forms of culture, theater, have played very important roles in energizing movements towards greater success and impact. And we need to go back to that in a very substantial way when we are losing the information and communications battle in very, very substantial terms. Because there's no question that this majority of people in the world don't want gender exploitation, want action on climate, want inequality to be reduced substantially from what it is now and all of that. Uh, but why are we not winning then? 
why are those agendas not winning when you see opinion polls, even in the United States, say this now that about 80% of the people want action on climate. So then it begs the question that we also have flawed electoral systems. In many countries today, we have the form of democracy without the substance of democracy. So this is a period of reimagining the future and recognizing that given that so many things were delayed in terms of taking action for so long, what is needed now is substantive structural and systemic change, not simply rearranging the deck chairs while humanity sinks into oblivion. That was global activist Kumi Nairu discussing his memoir, Letters to My Mother, The Making of a Troublemaker.